All right. So you might notice we have a new screen. Um, this screen is not great for what I'm displaying on it right now, which is just the handout because I, the text for the handout is um, right for a piece of paper, but not for the screen. That's not why I made it that way. Um, but it's good for the people on Zoom that are on Zoom joining us. And now if I really want to embarrass them, I can put them up on the screen. I can show their video, but I won't do that to them. Um, so for this particular study, the screen is not necessarily going to benefit us, but it just shows what I have on my computer screen. So I thought I just might as well turn on the TV. The nice thing about this screen and why those upgrades were, we're in the midst of upgrading our worship technology, both in here and in the Family Life Center. And so that'll be taking place uh, slowly between now and December. Um, the nice thing about the screen compared to the old projector that we had is that um, you can see it. I, this isn't a great example because again, the text is too small, but uh, you can see it in the light. It's bright enough to see in the light, whereas the projector often got faded out when we had the lights on. We had to turn off the light so you could see the projector. Anyway, so that'll be very nice. Uh, that said, um, I think it's time to pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for this Reformation Day. And this day is not about humans. Well, this day is about one human, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, and the eternal gospel that is proclaimed, that we are saved by grace through faith in him. We thank you for that good news, and we pray that would always be at the forefront of everything we do, speak, and think. So, Lord, we pray that you would be with us at this Bible study time. We thank you for the opportunity to have this special event tonight. And uh, we pray that all would go well, both here at church this morning and this evening, and that your people would be fed that we would be kept steadfast in your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, by the way, uh, we do have a couple people who are unable to come tonight, like, you know, maybe four to six uh, people who've let me know that. So if you are a person who has not signed up and would like to come tonight to our event, um, come find me. We can talk. Okay, but... Uh, we are finishing handout number three, which we were on last week. And the last section for us to talk about is purgatory. And the reason why we're talking about this at this point is we've been talking about what happens when a believer uh, dies. And there is a large section of the Christian faith, uh, that is our brothers and sisters in Roman Catholicism, that have a belief in purgatory. Um, whenever we bring up another faith's teaching and compare our teaching to them, our, my point, our point is never to speak poorly about or do anything other than just explain in a, a significant difference that we have in belief from them. And the reason why we feel strongly about that is based in scripture. And so we don't believe it because it's not in Scripture. And in fact, Scripture, as you'll see me lay out, I think argues quite the opposite. So, again, it's not to speak badly about our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church, but it is to make sure that we have a clear understanding for the comfort of our consciences that purgatory is not a biblical teaching. So, uh, let's start with this. On your handout, it says, Purgatory is not taught in the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that most believers need purification before they are fit to enter heaven. So this is now a quote from the Catechism from the Catholic Church. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification, so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect. So that's what they teach. I'll expand on that just a little bit. So the Catholic Church has a different understanding of absolution and uh, the forgiveness of sins than we do. Our sins are forgiven in Christ, 
Jesus came as our Savior to take away the condemnation of hell and death, eternal death that we deserved. We're all on the same page there. But the Catholic Church also teaches that although you may go to the church or go to your priest and, and ask for forgiveness and he'll announce the forgiveness of Christ for your sins, they believe then an extra step of penance or working off this purification that's being talked about needs to occur. And it'll either occur, you know, so you, you've sinned, now you need to kind of um, work back this purification to be able to enter heaven. And so that purification will either occur in this world or in purgatory. So when the priest offers, the, you know, says your sins are forgiven to the person coming to confess their sins, they will also give them some sort of penance. And that penance is what's necessary in order to be purified from the sin that was confessed. It's forgiven, but there's an additional purification process that needs to happen. The most holy of holy people, you know, what the Catholic Church calls the saints, and by that they mean kind of this elite club of people who led such holy lives, they go straight into heaven because they don't need that extra purification. You know, the rest of us, maybe who didn't uh, lead such holy lives, that's what purgatory is for. And, you know, it might be hundreds of years, it might be thousands of years, it might be some time, I don't know how they establish that, that's needed. And it's not quite hell, but it's not necessarily pleasant either. And you endure that, and then you're ready to go into heaven. And again, they say, well, no, we are saved by grace alone. You wouldn't be able to even get into purgatory had it not been for Christ. But that's that's what they teach. And by the way, this quite relevant for Reformation Sunday. This was Martin Luther's issue because there was an abuse, and the Catholic Church recognized this was an abuse. This isn't something that they uh, necessarily condone today, but what people were saying was using that threat of purgatory in the 1500s and selling a piece of paper called an indulgence as a fundraiser scheme and saying, you loved one, or you can buy this for a, a loved one of yours. You can buy this for, for yourself or for them and spring their soul out of purgatory. And so they can go straight to, it's like a, it's like a, a get out of jail free card. And, um, and the little saying that was being uh, shared by uh, Johann Tetzel and those who were selling these indulgences was once the coin in the coffer clings, the soul out of purgatory springs. And, um, you know, for, for, a, for a people who did not know the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it, was, it had been muddled and, and muddied, um, that was terrifying to hear. And, of course, they bought it because they would do anything that they could if it meant that they could make it to heaven uh, or their loved one make it to heaven. So, um, so this is what's taught. This, uh, just one more piece of background information, this belief was not something that it sort of arose um, gradually over the centuries. Um, obviously, this is not found in scripture. This is not found even in the early church, but it might have its basis actually in some Jewish beliefs that arose between the testamental times. So between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, you actually get some Jewish teaching, some rabbinic teaching, some Pharisaical teaching that pointed to this. And so that's kind of where the origins are. But it didn't make its way into the church and didn't make its way into official doctrine until centuries later. So that's the background on purgatory. Any questions from that standpoint before we look at some scripture? Clarification? Okay, I have a microphone here. This comes from my 16-year Catholic education. Okay. Uh, first of all, when I was in the Catholic Church, they taught us that there's mortal sin and venial sin. Venial sin is I stole a pen from work. Mortal sin is that I assaulted you. And depending on what the sin is, they determine how grievous it is. I think that's kind of how this started. Yeah. Um, but... The other understanding, and I agree with you, that it probably happened somewhere when they had um, all these dictators in the Middle Ages that were just causing havoc everywhere. 
And finally, the Catholic Church teaches that their faith is based upon scripture plus tradition, right. which is where some of these things come out with. And I thought first thing this morning on Reformation Sunday, this is probably an interesting subject to talk about. <laughs> it is, yeah. And that faith plus tradition is a good point because they do hold uh, scripture very highly, but they also have tradition, which means all the teachings of the popes, the councils, um, the you know, the history of the church that is of equal authority as God's word. So even if they don't find it in God's word, it's still taught in the church because that's equally um, normative. That's equally authoritative. I saw another hand. Was that Carolyn? Could they be seeing, oh, sorry, I didn't realize how loud it was. Could they be seeing some of this for purgatory and stuff in some of those additional um, Bible books that they include in their Bible? Because they got like 73 and we only got 66. Yeah. So there's, because I remember hearing a lot of stuff about what they call for pointing towards things like this. And they're like, well, but Martin Luther just threw those books out. So they kind of, well, he didn't want, but of course, you know, they're, they're just additional ones that include more things that maybe could get interpreted as purgatory or is it more yeah. like just the faith? Cause so you're referring, I don't know those books very well. Yeah. You're referring to the Apocrypha. Those are those books that uh, mostly rose up again in that intertestamental time. And you're right. They do actually quote some verses from the Apocrypha to um, to validate that. I uh, looked that up, actually, and I didn't want to get too into the weeds in, in this particular study to start studying the Apocrypha together. We can, if you're interested. But um, uh, even those verses don't clearly teach the per Like, it doesn't clearly teach purgatory. And there's actually a lot of debate that not even those verses from the Apocrypha clearly teach it. So, um, so yes, they do rely on some verses from the Apocrypha uh, to do that, but we would even disagree with that. By the way, Martin Luther didn't throw it out. Um, the Apocrypha, as, it, as did many people, and we would even agree with this today, you can go to Concordia Publishing House, our publishing house, and buy a reader's edition Apocrypha. Say, the Apocrypha is good to read. It's not scripture. Neither Jewish nor Christian tradition says it's scripture, um, but uh, but it doesn't mean it's not good to read just as a faith edifying thing, as long as you know what it is. So again, these are just books that were never received into the canon of Holy Scripture because um, we don't believe that it it was either prophetic, uh, that is written by a sent prophet of, of God pointing to Jesus Christ, uh, nor received with that kind of authority. Different people wrote it. No, no, yeah. I, I, what I find very interesting is that even now, uh, some Catholics still pay penance for their loved ones who they believe are in purgatory. Well, and, and whether they they blatantly or explicitly pay, I, I, I don't know. I do know if you go to a Catholic funeral, that's called a mass. And if you listen carefully to the word, I've been to many of them, you listen to the words that the priest says, that service is being offered for the sake of their loved one who's died, that their prayers may be heard on their behalf, that their time in purgatory might be shortened. Um, so again, this although it's not as crass as selling indulgences, there's still this idea that this has to be uh, worked off, that a purification process has to happen. Again, they believe in being saved by Jesus, but a purification process has to happen in order that for that person to enter heaven. Mark? I don't know if this is what Trish is referring to, but there is kind of a tradition in the Catholic faith of uh, making a donation, I'll say, to another kind of unrelated, uh, might be a monastery or a congregation to uh, say a mass or pray for your loved one who has died. So it's very similar to what you're talking about. I see. So offering prayers on their behalf, which again is what that funeral service is doing as well. Okay. It, it does happen, Pastor, because uh, my sister just lost her daughter last two weeks ago, my niece, and uh, they had a they had us, you know, say a prayer and yeah, also give a mass to 
our our niece. Yeah. So it does happen today. And and again, we we love our fellow Christians, and they are Christian. Um, but we just have to really vehemently disagree with them on this point that that's not biblical. And what it does is it robs people. You know, when I do at, at one of the funerals we've had recently, someone asked me, um, do you ever get tired of preaching at a funeral? And I said, no, because <laughs> honestly, I look forward not to someone dying, obviously, but I look forward to having this opportunity to provide the comfort that only Jesus can provide at that moment. And when else do you get a captive audience of people who might be at all different walks of faith at that moment to share that with? It's a special time. And so, you know, we don't want to rob people of the comfort that the gospel actually brings. So along those lines, let's look at a couple passages of scripture starting at Psalm 103 um, that might give us some indication of, of how God feels about this. So let's look at Psalm 103 verses 8 through 12. And do I have a volunteer who would be, sorry, Tom, I'll ask you maybe to, okay, you're in luck. It's Cindy right next to you. Uh, if you could uh, read that, please. Psalm 103, 8 through 12. Yes. Um, as far as, oh, wait a minute, I gotta go back down. Sorry. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions, from us. Thank you. And I'm sure you've heard those verses and just how much of a comfort they are. Well, let's just point out, according to verse 10, particularly, what does not motivate God in how he deals with us? Our sins. He does not deal with us according to our sins. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. So our sin is not how God deals with us. And thanks be to God for that, because if he did, we would be in trouble. But he says, I do not deal with you according to your sins. And then verse 12, when we are forgiven, what happens to our sin? It is removed as far as the east is from the west. And when you think about, well, what is east? The concept of east, right? It's kind of an infinity type thing, right? How do you stop going east? Well, you can go on east as far and, and as long as you are possibly able to travel. Same for going west. So if God takes your sins and separates them as far as east is from the west, those are direct opposite of each other. There is no point at which, I mean, okay, in a globe sense, right, you do meet, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the concept of going that way versus that way. And you, they will never meet. They will never meet. And, that, and it's because God does not deal with us according to our sins. Today on Reformation Day, we talk a lot about justification, right? How is it that we are justified in God's eyes? And that's a biblical word. You know, uh, we hear it in Romans 3 in our epistle reading. God justifies us with the righteousness that Christ earned uh, for us. And so there are different metaphors that help explain the, the topic of justification. Again, just to make clear, the Catholic Church has a concept of justification where it's sort of like a financial metaphor. You know, so... If there's this much debt, then this much payment has to be made. And okay, the Bible actually does kind of talk like that, like Jesus paid our debt, but we see it as paid in full, where they see it as, okay, there's a debt, and yes, Jesus forgives you and takes away the, the condemnation of that sin, but then you got to kind of start putting metaphorical coins in the box to kind of earn back that justification. And that's kind of the, the metaphor that they use. Whereas a Lutheran metaphor of justification is we see justification in, it's called a forensic metaphor, uh, a, a legal metaphor. So we view justification as God declaring us righteous. 
it is as if the judge speaks you righteous and we're not because we know we're sinners, but God in his mercy, because of Jesus Christ says, on account of my son, you are now righteous. You are now justified. And we are because the judge has declared it. So what the judge says, especially God, is true, is reality. And so on account of Jesus, we are declared righteous. That's a forensic, that's a legal uh, declaration of justification. That's how we view it, how we view what scripture says. And so when God says, you are forgiven, you are made clean, I have taken your sin and put it as far away from you as east is from the west, we take God at his word in having done that. Okay, ready to move on to Hebrews 10? Hebrews is towards the back of the New Testament. And could I have a volunteer to read that? Trish has that? Okay, thank you. Hebrews 10, 11 through 18, please. Every day the priests stand and do their religious service, often offering the same sacrifices. Those sacrifices can never take away sin. But after Christ offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right side of God. And now Christ waits there for his enemies to be put under his power. With one sacrifice, he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also tells us about this. First, he says, this is the agreement I will make with them at that time, says the Lord. I will put my teachings in their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he says, their sins and the evil things they do, I will not remember anymore. Now, when these have been forgiven, there is no more need for a sacrifice for sins. Okay, thank you. So let's look at how the sacrifice of Jesus is greater than that of the sacrifices performed by the Old Testament priests. Let's look at verse 11. The priest stands daily, it's talking about the priests of the Old Testament, at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. What sacrifices were those? Animals, yeah. Now, were they, they weren't wrong in doing that. That's what the law of Moses said. But what the author of Hebrews is saying is those sacrifices can't take away sins. So you might ask, well, then why did God tell him to do that? Well, God said these will take away sins, but only, and this is what we're going to get to here, only insofar as they are a sign. Remember, they're a shadow and a copy of the real sacrifice to come, which was going to be Jesus, the once for all sacrifice. So they did take away the sins of the Old Testament people, but not in and of themselves, right? Sacrifices of animals don't take away human sins. They took away human sins because God was making a promise through that because it pointed them forward to the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. And that's what that goes on to say. Verse 12, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Then looking at verse 14, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, there's that word, sanctified, which means to be made holy. Do you remember our quote from the Catholic Catechism? How does Hebrews say we are sanctified? Through the blood of Jesus, through the single offering of Jesus. And is it, does it have to be done lots and lots of times? No, oh, it's done one, one time. And so the author of Hebrews is saying, hey, look at what's going on in Jerusalem at the temple and what has gone on for thousands of years. Think about how many animals lost their lives in those sacrifices. And here's Jesus, as John the Baptist says, the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And by his once for all sacrifice on the cross, he fulfilled it all. And there's no more sacrifices needed. And we are perfected. 
not because we got better somehow, but because Jesus did it for us. So that's how the sacrifice of Jesus is greater than the Old Testament priests. Julie? Yeah, so if you couldn't hear, Julie was saying, well, if, if Jesus, uh, if purgatory is true, then it seems like Jesus died for nothing. And, and again, in the Catholic Church, they reason that out. They say, no, no, Jesus died to save you, but then there has to be a, a further purifying process. Whereas we would say, and by the way, I agree with you, but what we would say is scripture makes it clear in these passages and others that there's no further purification needed. Jesus took care of it. And by the way, I can't purify myself. I need someone else to do it for me. And Jesus did. Right, exactly. Yeah, not, not friends, not family, not myself, but Jesus. So then looking at this passage again, look at verse 17. How does God think of our sins according to verse 17? Doesn't remember them. He doesn't remember them. And God's not being stupid. He's saying, I am choosing to put them out of sight. It's a choice God made. He's saying, because of Jesus, you are perfect in my eyes. And by the way, those are both quotes from Jeremiah, those two indented quotes there. So there's some further scriptural evidence of what we're talking about here. So what's no longer required when there's forgiveness? Verse 18. No, yep, no offering for sin. So in other words, not only do the Old Testament sacrifices need to be, uh, not need to be occurring anymore after Jesus, which is why we don't sacrifice animals anymore. Um, but uh, there's not even anything we could do to make ourselves perfect. Jesus makes us perfect. And that's good news. That's really good news. So, um, any questions about that? So, should you have a conversation with a Catholic brother or sister that you love and trust and they're willing to talk to you about it, you might go to one of these passages and say, hey, let's read this together and talk about it. You tell me what you hear, and I'll tell you what I hear. Have a good civil conversation about it. Okay. Well, then, in that case, let's move on to the next handout. Does everyone have a number four? Julie has a question. Go ahead, Julie. Sorry, Cindy, could you hand her the microphone? No, it's okay, yep. it's okay. Thank you. Do you think that God would think it's sin for people to try to better what he's already done and handle it themselves? I mean, that seems kind of sinful to me. Just to disregard that he did that on the cross and this... They look, our dollars will help or whatever. Doesn't that seem sinful to you? Or, or you can't say that, I guess. You can nod. <laughs> Just um, kidding. I, I would say yes, but the reason why I hesitate is um, I don't want everyone to leave and anyone who might watch this recording saying, well, pastors calling all Catholics sinful and they're terrible people or something like that. But just generally speaking, when we add or take away from what God clearly says in his word, that's a problem. And that was the problem 500 years ago in the Reformation and why the Reformation had to occur. And why we as Lutherans, by the way, don't view what became called Lutheranism um, as a split from the church. What the reformers made clear, and this is what's made clear in our Lutheran confessions in the Book of Concord, is we're laying out what the church, what the word, sorry, what the Bible has always taught and what the church has always taught. 
and we perceive that it's the Catholics who have split from what's true. And we're trying to clearly proclaim what we believe is true and, and, and what's at stake and why this was worth dying for, which many of them did, the early reformers, early Christians, Christians of all ages. What makes Christianity worth dying for is that it's an eternal truth. As we heard in our first reading today from Revelation, it's an eternal gospel. It doesn't change. And so when we in any way try to add to it, saying we need to do something more to what Jesus did or take away from it saying, ah, that's not really what Jesus did, then yeah, that's a problem. That's a big problem. No, no, it's a, it, your, what your question, you didn't put me on spot, what your question highlights is why this is important. And it is. It's the most important thing. Yeah. Other questions? Um, yeah, so I was taught, um, obviously, I always wondered where it came from, and now I know it's not actually in the Bible, but um, my family always talked about healing waters. And it's the same concept. And it was mostly intended for somebody who maybe they were a believer once, and then they fall away from Christ for whatever reason, severe mental anguish, mm -hmm. uh, mental illness, what have you. It was, and it was kind of a, a beautiful thought for us because it was, um, there's one last hope. Mm -hmm. There's one last hope that if they go through the healing waters or through purgatory and are healed, then they can choose once more to believe sure. yeah, and, and then get into heaven. And I could see why that would be very comforting. And I would say we do have that hope and that comfort apart from purgatory, because, um, you know, you go to like Jesus's parable of the sowing of the word, right? The seed that gets broadcast. Um, and although there are some that might get, you know, that word gets choked out by the cares or concerns of the world, um, that seed is always with them. God's word and his Holy Spirit is always at work in their lives. And so we would never try to judge where someone's heart was, maybe if they died, could be apart from the church. And our prayer is always that even if they are apart from the church, that God is still at work in their lives, still at work in their heart to remember the promises that they once professed. And we take great comfort also knowing that faith is not a good work of ours. Faith is a work of God. None of us could believe unless God had worked that faith in us. So what can convert me versus someone who seems like the worst sinner in the world requires the same amount of God power to convert hearts. And so if he can work in all of us to create faith, um, that's where our hope is, that that person also will have received that gift of faith and, and received it and trusted in it to whatever capacity that they're able to. So that's why I say I, I agree with you that that hope is important to have, especially for our loved ones who may be further from a, from the church than we would like. Um, and so we pray for them and we ask that God continues to, to work in their hearts. Good. Okay, so we're going to now next talk about, we'll start it today and then we'll continue next week. Um, we're going to do a, a little handout here, a little uh, session on heaven and earth. And this concept of heaven and earth together and heaven and earth apart. What is it? So to start out, let's take 60 seconds. So spend about 30 seconds on earth. You don't have to, I'm not going to ask you necessarily to share. Um, so feel free to write whatever you want. Brainstorm five things that are in heaven on the left there and brainstorm five things that are on earth. Just do those two things. Brainstorm five things that are in heaven and brainstorm five things that are on earth. Okay, so let's just do that real quick. Okay, if you've brainstormed five things that are in heaven, now move on to five things that are on earth.
Okay. Let's just shout out some things. Um, shout it out. I'll repeat it so everyone can hear it. Uh, things that are in heaven. Jesus. What is? What else? Eternal life. Joy. Peace. Our loved ones. Angels. Beauty. Heavenly home. Light. Choirs singing. Okay, that's a pretty good list. I would agree. What's all? Our name? Oh, written in the book of life, perhaps? Good. All right. Now, let's do things that are on earth. Sin, war, Holy Spirit, politicians, <laughs> advertisers. <laughs> yeah. What's that, Cindy? Conflict. What is it? Darkness. Trials, devil, disease. What's that, Mark? Death. Yeah, th these have been somewhat um, not untrue, but also very um, pessimistic, might I say. Are there any good things on earth? Nature. Hope. Church. The church militant, right? We are the church militant. Yeah. Now, this is, I was interested to see if this would happen, and I heard some of you list them, and maybe there's more on your papers. Are there things that are on heaven, in heaven and on earth? People, love, I heard the Holy Spirit. There's joy in the church. And, well, animals, we'll talk about, are there animals? Love. Uh, the church is in both heaven and on earth, right? Now, we call the church in heaven the church triumphant and us the church militant, but it's not two different churches. It's the church. So church militant means we are still pressing on. We are still battling. We are still in the, in the foray, whereas those who have entered heaven are at rest, right? They're not battling anymore. They're at peace. Okay, so based on all that, let's do this next part together. How would you define what heaven is? What's a possible definition of heaven? Eden? Holy? Paradise? Peaceful? Full of worship? Mike, my, my, what'd you say? Qu quiet? But think about it in terms of what distinguishes it from earth. Because a lot of those things could be said of earth, too. No more tears, no more pain. Hol well, but are we holy? And we're on earth. Okay, eternal. Hmm. Ken? Presence of Jesus. Okay, I think this is good. That's a good concept list there. How would you define what earth is, then, that distinguishes it from heaven? Chaos, Okay. Temporary home, okay. Unpredictable, that's true. But is that what defines earth? I'm going to push back a little bit and then not talk about it because we're actually, this is why we're doing this topic, number four. I would push back against the definition of earth as temporary and heaven as eternal. Because that's not what we find in the Bible. So I'm going to throw that out there as a little teaser. And now we'll find out what the definition of heaven and earth is. So that was just brainstorming time. So we had fun. That was good. Okay, uh, we have time here. So let's go to Genesis 1. First book, first, first chapter, first verse, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Could I have a volunteer to read that, please? Okay, Linda has that. Thank you. One am I reading? One, seven, seven, and eight. Okay. okay. Just Genesis 1.1 1, 1 right now. Yeah. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so... Just first one. Oh, just first one. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll get to, no, it's okay. Get ahead here. Sorry. Yep. We'll get there. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, so what was created in the beginning? Heaven and earth. Now, let's focus on the word heaven or heavens for a moment. So now, Linda, could you read seven and eight, please? Again? <laughs> Again. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Does anyone have a different word in verse 8? Heaven. Now, in all of these cases where heaven comes up, or the word sky, it's the same Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is ha -shamayim. And it's a plural word, which is why it's sometimes translated in English, the heavens. But what does this mean? There are three ways that in Hebrew, the word heaven was thought of, even though it's the same word. There are three, um, we call them conceptual signifies, three things that are being signified by that word that could technically be different. The first one is what Linda just read in verses seven and eight. How would you define that word heaven? What is it talking about? And this is anyone. When God took the waters and divided them and called that expanse heaven, your English translation actually cheated for you and gave you the word sky. So the first level of meaning of heavens in as it's used in Hebrew can just mean the sky, where the birds fly. Yeah, kind of, yeah, the atmosphere, although they didn't have maybe a concept of that back then. But when they say heavens, they could just mean, hey, the place where the birds are. The second meaning comes up several places. I'm just giving us one example of each. Could someone please look up and read Deuteronomy 419? Gretchen, thank you. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all hosts of heaven, you will be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. Okay, so this is a passage, if you kind of zoom out, you see this is um, idolatry being forbidden, specifically worshiping the sun, moon, and stars, which, you know, people throughout history have done because you look up and you say, oh my goodness, look at these wonderful celestial things. They must be what created us. And in the God's word, he's clearly saying, don't fall into that trap. But specifically in this verse, it says, beware lest you rise, raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun, moon, and stars, all the host of heaven, talking about those things, that you be drawn away from them, bow down to them, and serve them. That things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. Why did God give us the sun, moon, and stars? For light? Also for what? The keeping of the seasons and time. God gave it to us as a gracious gift. He's saying, don't turn my good gift into your false god. But notice the use of the word heaven. How is this use of the word heaven being used? Like, think of the host of heaven. What does heaven mean there? It's not just the sky. It's the entire universe, the cosmos. Space, we would call it. So sometimes, sometimes in Hebrew, it was used for the word sky. Sometimes it was used for outer space, the cosmos, the universe. The host of the universe, the host of heaven. There's one more way that it would be used. Let's look at 1 Kings 8.30. 1 Kings 8.30. And would someone be willing to read that for us, please? John has it up here. Thank you, John. So 1 Kings 8.30. And listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place and listen in heaven your dwelling place and when you hear forgive okay so this is in Solomon's prayer of dedication of the newly built temple he's saying listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward the temple in Jerusalem and listen in where heaven 
What is heaven, according to that verse? The dwelling place of God. So the third level, so to speak, the third meaning of heaven could be God's dwelling place. Now, this is interesting because this helps inform a somewhat confusing passage that I'm sure you've heard in the New Testament. We're going to fast forward to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 4. And this is the Apostle Paul. And by the way, just to help you understand what's being talked about, Paul, in his great humility, is writing about a vision he's had, but he's writing in the third person because he doesn't even want to boast about it. So when you hear him talking about a man he knows, he's talking about himself. Okay, but let's read what's being talked about in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4. Would someone read those verses, please? Okay, uh, Mark's got it. Thank you. I must go on boasting. Though there's nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Okay. So he's not even permitted to utter things about what he saw in heaven. Now, when he says heaven, which one of those three meanings do you think he means? Where God dwells. But you notice what he called it? The third heaven. What do you think he means by that? You got the sky, and you got the universe, and he's talking about the place where God dwells. Mike, you have a thought on that? You're gonna need a microphone? Okay. Okay. I can count on you for some controversy. That's good. I tell you what it's not. What is it not? It's not levels of heaven. Not levels of heaven. Because there are certain Pentecostal pastors that wrote books on the levels of heaven yeah but i think from my footnotes i think what's going on is paul spiritually had some kind of a vision and in that vision he knew that he was touched by god for some kind of a special mission yeah he can't really describe it we don't really know when it happened but he has some kind of a unique vision where he recognized what God called him to be. And it has nothing to do with levels of heaven. Right. I agree with you. In fact, his point in first Corinthians, second Corinthians 12, this is where he goes on to talk about the thorn in his flesh and that he will boast not in these surpassing visions that he was given. He's actually not even going to talk about it. He's not going to tell you what he saw because he's not permitted by God to do that. What has God permitted him to talk about? God has permitted him to talk about the thorn in his flesh and his weakness. He says, therefore, I'll boast not about those things. I'll boast all the more about my weakness in Christ, because in Christ, in his weakness, Christ's power is made perfect and his grace is sufficient. That's what Paul's going to talk about. So yeah, people who then go on to expand, well, we should be, you know, talking about all these visions of heaven and things like that. Well, that's not what Paul's doing. So I don't think we should do that either. And you're right. I don't think this is referring to levels of heaven, like you got to earn your way up into heaven or something like that. That's not what this is talking about. Paul was a Jew and he was very familiar with Hebrew. He was writing in Greek here, but he has a very Hebrew oriented mind. I think it's pretty clear he's talking about the third level of heaven, meaning the place where God dwells, as opposed to the sky or the universe. It is comforting. Right. Yeah, you don't have to worry about any of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, questions or comments on that? So to recap then, I would say my definition of heaven, at least the way that we often refer to it, is the place where God dwells. I think that's a biblical definition, the place where God dwells. In the next verses, we're going to see that, guess what the definition of earth is going to be? The place where people dwell. And my argument is, that heaven and earth were meant to be 
one and they were separated because of the fall. But what's God's purpose? What's the whole story of the Bible? Is God bringing them back together again? And that's why I say it's not that earth is eternal and, or excuse me, heaven is eternal and earth isn't. My definition of heaven and earth from the Bible is heaven is where God dwells, earth is where people dwell, and God's purpose is to bring them together in eternity. So, a little preview. We're going to stop there and we'll pick up uh, at this point next week. Um, let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great love and mercy and grace and for the message of salvation, which brings your dwelling place into our lives and into this place, that we may know that you are here among us and we are so thankful for that. Help us as we go out into this world, a world that can be chaotic and distressing and troublesome, but we know that you are not absent from us or from this world. And so help us point others to you. Show us an opportunity this week to be able to share that good news. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.